Welcome. It is great to have you with you with you with us here this Sunday morning, this holiday weekend, kind of. We'll we'll talk about that here in a minute. But a couple things I want to let you know before we jump in uh, to God's word today, and that is this: we started um, recruiting from volunteers for the next couple months, June and, or July and August. Uh, these are the hardest two months of the entire year to fill with volunteers. We know that uh, it's the summer; everybody's schedules are a little crazy, and so uh, we get that. But if you could take a peek on your way out and see what options are available, that would be awesome. Here in two weeks, in two weeks, we get to start the the questions answered series. Now, we have the first three weeks planned out already, but we're still looking for uh, a couple more things, um, some insights from you guys. So take a second, fill that out for us. You can write it on your Connect cards or their sheets at the Welcome Center. We would love um, to address some of those questions that you guys have about faith um, and just even this world that that we live in. Uh, Lastly, um, I've I've been praying for a couple weeks now for the specific people uh, that God wants me to ask, but I, I He's yet to connect those dots in my mind yet and, and figure out who it is that I'm supposed to talk to. Uh, we still need a couple folks um, to go with us to, to Poland to make that trip happen. We have a couple that's already signed up. Matter of fact, they've already uh, went and got their passports this week, um, got that all squared away, so they're good to go. Um, but we need a, a couple more folks um, to join us to be able to take the trip and have enough people to do the work. And so um, if that's you, if you can get away in September for about eight days, 16th to 24th, and would like to go and work at a Christian camp in Poland for a week, helping rebuild their amphitheater, um, We'd love to have you. It's going to be an awesome time. Um, it'll be neat to go and connect with that ministry that we've supported for quite a while here at Berea. Um, we're excited about doing that. So I want to just follow up. Last week, I know some of you did because I've talked to some of you. Um, you began forming some new relationships. You went to lunch with someone. Or uh, conversations I had were, well, I couldn't meet them for lunch on Sunday, but I met them on Saturday for lunch because that's where our schedule worked. Or, oh, well, we had them over for dinner on Sunday evening. Um, that was great. I hope you're taking us up on this and that it wasn't a one-time thing um, that you were looking for someone. Oh, last week, we had a chance to meet a couple that we knew, like we talked to them, but that was it. And so we got to hear about their family and their story and their place of employment and, and just their life in general. And that is what this body of Christ should be about is doing life together. So hopefully those have gone well. Hopefully you've anticipated someone to even today to meet with, or maybe God will reveal someone while you're here today that you're supposed to go with after church or maybe over this evening. It is so important. The one thing I'll caution you that can happen is though, you'll go out with somebody that first Sunday or whenever it is, and, and you guys will just hit it off and it'll be awesome. And so guess what you do next Sunday? You go with the same people again and again and again and again, and yeah, you still don't meet anybody new. So invite new people to go with you as you continue doing that. All right, that wasn't a hard question. I'm worried. I'm very worried about today. But anyway, um, we'll see. I don't, I don't know about, about you guys, but this 4th of July weekend, anytime holidays are in the middle of the week like that, it just messes up everything, doesn't it? Like, it's just your whole schedule. It's like, I don't even know. Uh, we had a conversation with someone this morning that genuinely thought today was Saturday. Like, really thought it was Saturday. I don't even know what today is. I'm glad that I have this position because otherwise I would be confused as well. It is hard and even harder to go back to work on Monday for those of you that had Friday off as well. That four-day weekend is spectacular, but it's also a little difficult to get back in the routine. The reality is this. As a country, most of us celebrated our freedom that we have in this country. And I don't know as a believer how you've really considered these freedoms over the course of your life. Hopefully, as you continue to mature, you'll really reflect and understand and appreciate what we have here. Because the freedoms that we have were earned by a tremendous amount of sacrifice. A lot of lives were given in order for us to have this freedom. And you may or may not ever have thought about this, but the freedoms that we have are simply given to us by words that are written on a really old piece of paper. 200 years ago, they put these words on a piece of paper, and by God's grace alone, somehow, some way, those words have held this country intact, messed up at times, but still together, and still give us this tremendous freedom. I don't know if you realize that, that this country is really the first and only example of its kind in the world history. We're the first ones to ever try this, and we're the only ones really doing it the same way this many years later. And I don't know if you've really thought about the reality of how fragile our freedoms are, how simply and easily they can and are at times being taken from us by the ruling of a judge or by the election of people that have no respect or understanding of the freedoms which are granted in that document. It's incredible that God 
has allowed this thing to continue to exist because I truly believe that is the only way that this place has continued to exist as we have known it, at least in the past. But the reality of freedom is this, that as believers in Christ, we have a whole other layer of freedom to celebrate. And what's awesome about it is you can look across the globe. You can find the most persecuted country in the entire world where Christianity is illegal, and you will find people that have the exact same freedom that you and I do in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we get to share that, the freedom from bond, uh, the freedom from the bond of sin and guilt and shame in our life, the freedom from death the freedom from despair and hopelessness that just simply corrupts all the world around us. Everyone you talk to is in despair and distress. They're worried about the future. And you have a freedom in Christ that should allow you to rise above that and to help those through that pain that they might be dealing with, even though it's hard. Now, it might not seem like a a 4th of July message on freedom and things like that would in any way tie into this series, Be Nice, But wouldn't you know that our author of choice for this series, Paul, absolutely perfectly tied them together in Galatians chapter 5. Listen to this in verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Yes, our freedoms are incredible, but we can use those freedoms absolutely to be sinful. In our context for this series, don't use your freedom to be rude. Don't use your freedom to be a jerk, to take advantage of people, to speak poorly of people, to criticize people, to put down others, especially other believers, or the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church. But instead, use your freedom to serve others humbly, to love your neighbors. Because if you don't, if you take the alternate approach, the worldly approach, then you will bite and devour each other and ultimately destroy, potentially, even the local body of Christ. So, yes, our freedom absolutely plays a role in who we are as believers. God has given us the freedom to choose Him, first and foremost, the freedom to love Him. And when we do, He gives us freedom to live our lives for Him, to obey His teachings, to serve Him, to love and to serve others. Freedom's a really, really, really big deal. But I find it interesting that in the country with maybe, arguably, the greatest amount of freedom ever in all of human history, I find it really interesting that this is not the place where you see the greatest amount of kingdom growth. We have the freedom to do whatever we want to reach people for the gospel of Christ, but yet we aren't using it any longer If you've seen any of the studies or research statistics that exist out there, you find the church is the fastest growing, first and foremost, on the continent of Africa, where it's estimated by 2025 there'll be over 600 million Christians. It's like twice our population. That's incredible. Now, for those of you that grew up in the church, you might remember back in the day, we often sent missionaries out. To where? Africa. Hmm. Interesting. Huh. Huh that together, if you will. There's a small little country in East Asia, a little, little bitty place, a few people, called China. You might have heard of it. Um, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 million Christians there. You do know it's illegal, right, to be a Christian in China? Persecuted church, they're closing churches. They're letting it exist a little more, but it's an odd relationship, and we'll see how it works out in the end. Open Doors USA is an organization that works with a persecuted church all over the globe. Um, It's an incredible organization, and they estimate that there's about 800,000 Christians, so nearly a million Christians in a little country called Iran. Have you heard of them lately in the news? It's the fastest growing religion in Iran, where it is also illegal to be a Christian. I want you to think about that and understand that the Spirit can and will move anywhere, anywhere freedoms or not. It's time for us to start using the freedoms that God has given us to reach out to others. Let's pray. Father God, I I thank you for this morning, the chance that we have to dive into your word. Father, the reality of the freedoms that you've given us in this country, freedoms that uh, none of us in this room deserve for sure. But Father, since we have them, we might as well take advantage of them. Father, they are God-given freedoms and we have this opportunity to reach out in ways that other people in the world simply cannot and yet we often neglect that opportunity because we're free we don't feel the urgency 
So I pray that you convict us, change our hearts in that mindset as we consider what it means to be nice to one another within the church. But Father, also to reach out to those that do not know you yet. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we started this series a few weeks ago. It's only a three short week series. And so I really, really wanted to review because the purpose of this series is a foundational purpose for us, the church, moving forward and who God wants us to be. If you remember that very first week, if you listened or or were here, you might remember I gave you two very simple things that you probably learned from your mother growing up. The first one, of course, was if you don't have something nice to say, just don't say it at all. Man, that could be definitely be used within the church couldn't it? Absolutely. The second one, the one that you got called in the back seat of the car quite often, be nice to your brother or sister. Yeah, quit picking on each other. You, you get the picture. Really simple things, but critical things for followers of Jesus to do. The first passage that we studied was an incredible passage from Ephesians chapter 4, and it's how we are to treat one another within the church. It's how we're to interact so that the world will know who we are. If you haven't heard that message yet, if you haven't taken the time to do that, we encourage you to go online and watch it or to listen because this is a foundational passage, a foundational message for our church moving forward. And we have to be on the same page as brothers and sisters in Christ. When we're engaged in conversations as things are happening and, and things are moving and things are changing, we've got to hold each other accountable. And when we're talking with someone and their words are not what Paul is asking us to be in the church, we've got to call each other on that and say, hey, is, is this who we're to be as a follower of Christ? Is this how we're to respect and react to the bride of Christ or not? Paul gives us these very clear instructions, and I want to read this entire passage to you again because it is that important to who we're to be. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Yes, Christ gave himself. He gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? To equip people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we reach, there's that word again, unity. Unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ's church. We have to grow up. You have to. New people come to the church, yes, and they're looking to us to be examples, to be role models, to be mentors to them in their faith. We have to mature in our faith. Why? Because if we don't, then this won't happen. Verse 14, then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. If we do not mature in our faith, we will be caught off guard at a moment's notice and be persuaded away from Christ. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. This body of Christ needs to grow and become the mature head of the body, or the mature body of Christ. That's who we are to be. We're not meant to be these infants. People leave and come and go and doing these things all the time. That is not what Christ requires of us, quite honestly, in our relationship to him. But then verse 29, it gets to our language. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. When we speak ill of one another or the body of Christ, we are grieving the Holy Spirit of God. That is a serious offense that we need to be considerate of with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate. Forgive each other as Christ forgave you and follow God's example as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Paul's teaching almost always ends there. He'll go here, but he always comes back. Here's why, because this is what Jesus, don't ever forget, this is why you shut your mouth. This is why you treat each other. Because look what Jesus did for you. Is that not the least you could offer back to him? It's that important. We must love Jesus each other. Jesus himself said, it is the way people will know we are his followers, period, in discussion. That is our example to this world. We cannot be trapped. 
We cannot be trapped into talking about the church and the people of God in the same way that the world complains and whines and fights and argues about everything else. It is a trap that we often fall into, and Satan wants nothing more than to catch you up in it because it will keep people, maybe not you, but it will keep others from joining the body of Christ. In week two, we begin to shift focus to those without. Now, the word without does mean the opposite of within, but in our context, it means so much more. Yes, these are pre-Christians, as I love to call them. They're not part of the church, the body of Christ, yet. But they're also without Jesus, without his love, his grace, his forgiveness, his peace, and his freedom. We have so, 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 so much to share with each of those individuals as we come in contact with them. Paul challenged us in Colossians chapter 4 last week to devote ourselves to prayer, to be watchful, to be thankful, to pray for an open door to share the love of Jesus and more. He challenged us to pray that people would be able to understand our message, that our words will be clear. He advised us to be wise in how we act toward outsiders, those that don't know Jesus yet, and to make the most of every opportunity that we have. The last verse of the passage from last week said this, in your conversations, let them always be full of grace and seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Again, if you missed last week's session, it's so important, it's critical to the foundation of who we want to be as the future here at Berea. So take a moment, listen to it online, download the podcast, watch the video, whatever works in your format. If it's 10 minutes between stores in town, whatever it takes, because we're using God's word as our guidance to, as a church and how to deal with this culture and how to deal with each other and how to be the people of God he wants us to be. And the last thing you want is somebody within the church coming to you one day and say, hey, I don't think you ever listened to this. <laughs> yeah, maybe you ought to give this a, a, a quick listen before you keep talking. Think about that. It's so important. We challenged everybody last week to think of something really specific every day that you do, something in your daily routine that you probably do every morning, whether you're on vacation, whether you're at work, whether it's a whatever. You do this thing every day, and we ask you to take that moment that you're doing that and pray a simple prayer. God, give me the chance to show somebody your love today, period. That's it. No more to the prayer than that. God, just give me a chance today to show somebody your love whenever you're doing that same exact thing every single day. This isn't something else to do. It's not an event. It's not an appointment. It's not a meeting. It's who we are to be as followers of Christ. And we cannot wait to begin to hear those stories of the interactions that God has placed in your path throughout the day if you're willing to commit to that prayer. And see, here's what will happen. Some people haven't committed to doing that yet. But when they begin to hear your stories of how you committed, and this is the moment you took each day, and this is how you use that, this is your prayer, and this is how God has used that each day, when people start hearing those stories, they too will then join you in that same simple, simple commitment. The words of James from last week, the half-brother of Jesus, are incredibly challenging to us in this area. If anyone then knows the good that they ought to do and does not do it, it is sin for them. I know that's incredibly convicting for me because we all pass through our day and moments in our day when we know the good we should do, the conversation we should have, the encouragement we should offer, and we choose not to for one reason or another, and we must realize that that is sin, and we need to repent of that sin. But this is who we're to be. Think of it. If we as a church have this mindset, we know the good we ought to do, and we begin doing it. We don't pass it up because we know that it's sin to us, and then we begin to treat one another the way that God wants us to treat one another within the church. Can you imagine what the world will see when we rid the church of the things of the world that have infiltrated, and we begin to come the full, mature body of Christ? Watch out things will change. Things will change. People will be reached. The lost will be saved. The church will be built up and strengthened. This is the final week. In this final week, we're going to look at who we are, what we are to do, how we are to live, and even why. Paul even goes so far as to suggest one particular way in which the world might view us in our current state, shall we say. So if you're with, if you've got a Bible on your app or your phone or you're under the seat in front of you, there's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is where we're at today. Again, the words of Paul, this time to the church in Corinth. Incredible words. We're going to begin in verse 11 is where where we will start. So here we go. 2 Corinthians 5, 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade 
others. I want you to emphasize that word in your brain right now. Try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it's also plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, well, that's for God. If we're in our right mind, then it's for you. For Christ's love compels us. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one, no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in that way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this same message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. That's the third area to look at today. We are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. We're going to start all the way back at the beginning. I want to make sure you caught the word that Paul uses at the very beginning of that passage. Did you realize that as a follower of Christ and reaching out to others, you are to try to persuade them, persuade them to become a follower of Christ? Did you realize that you were called to do that? You're not just called to tell them. You're called to persuade them. There's a big difference. I I found this quote. It speaks quite well to this. Too often we speak only of the need to proclaim and explain the good news to the lost. But clearly the Bible teaches that we should be trying to persuade people of its truthfulness. Is this not what Christian apologetics is all about? We absolutely need to proclaim the good news of Jesus. It is the most powerful form of persuasion we can use. But it's not the end of the persuasion that we are to use. Vine's Dictionary of New Testament Words defines the word persuade from the original Greek this way. To prevail upon or win over. To bring about a change of mind by the influence of reason or moral considerations. This definition points out the need for both reason and morality in our efforts to appeal to those that do not yet know Jesus. Now, persuade oftentimes is seen as something negative. You might have been persuaded, shall we say, in your youth to do something that maybe wasn't the best idea known to man, right? Lots of adults are persuaded to do things or maybe even take positions or invest money or do this or do that, and it ends up being a crooked deal, Yes, the word persuade, you can use to deceive people using persuasion. Satan was the author of that. He did that in the garden to Adam and Eve. He persuaded them to thinking a certain direction, but that would certainly not be the way of Jesus, nor of the Holy Spirit as he guides and directs our words and our actions as we persuade others to Jesus. You see, one of the greatest forms of persuasion is this thing called evidence. You've watched it on every crime show you've ever seen with a courtroom case. It's all about persuasion, isn't it? And the greater the evidence, the more persuadive, persuading the argument. In our case, our persuasion is the evidence of our life. Not a perfect life, but a changed life. We are to share God's love for us We share with them the links to which Jesus went even for them, even though they do not know him or believe in him yet. Then we share with them how our lives have changed, how God has changed us, the difference that we've experienced, the before and after picture, if you will. This is how we persuade them with the truth of our lives and what God has done in us. Now, for me personally, I I got to create and design a class about this very topic called Testimony 101. And what we do is we get a group of people together that would love to be able to share their testimony, their story, their coming to faith, and how God has used them and changed them, but they just don't know how. 
And so we take four or five or six sessions and we sit down and we work through this whole process together and we help you craft your testimony, your argument, if you will, your proof of your faith in Jesus and the way you can persuade others. And so if that's something you might be interested in, if I get enough folks that say, hey, we should do that, I'll do it. And, and I'll teach that class because I love doing it because it's incredible to watch people then go out and share their story with other people to persuade those that don't know Jesus yet. Paul tells us that some people will think we're out of our minds. They're completely out of their minds. Now, be honest. As believers, as some of you that have been in church your whole life, have you ever met somebody that is so crazy in love with Jesus that you kind of look at them funny? Like, man, they are out of their minds. It's exactly what Paul's talking about. And the reality is, we are. We are. If we're truly in Christ, we've given our lives, our hearts, and our minds over to Jesus, the Spirit within us. We are no longer of this world, and that will make us look just a little bit different from everyone else. Paul goes on to share with us our motivation. Why? Why do this? What is it that's pushing us to do this? Well, it's Christ's love. I love this passage. You're going to hear it a lot from me. 2 Corinthians 5.14, for Christ's love compels us. If you ask some people in this church that are a part of some interesting ministries that you probably wouldn't like to be a part of, and you ask them, why are you doing that? They're going to say, because Jesus loves me, and I love those people, and I want to reach those people for Christ. Christ's love compels us. Why does his love compel us? Because look what he did for us. He died for us so that we could no longer be a slave to sin. We could no longer be a p- part of this world And we no longer live for ourselves, but instead live for him. It's an incredible verse, an incredible description. I love that word compel. It's what drives us. It's what motivates us. We can't resist it. It pushes us even when we don't want to do it because we're compelled by the love of Jesus to love others. But don't miss the truth behind it. Paul doesn't just say, well, Christ's love compels me to do it, so I do it. No, he says it compels me because, because I am convinced. Are you convinced that one died for all? Are you convinced that Jesus did that for you? First and foremost, you have to be convinced of that and then be convinced that he died for everyone else as well and that he rose again. And because of that, I no longer live for myself but for him. It's an incredible, incredible thing. And if I really truly believe that, I can't help but share that news with others. And if I choose to accept those truths, if I choose to be compelled by the love of Christ, then I I am found in Christ. I am a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. It's an incredible, incredible thing. Here's a problem. You deal with this a lot in the church with the world because we followers of Christ, we love the idea of the new coming. But for some reason, we have a really hard time with the old going. And we keep it with us and we drag it with us. And actually, Paul uses that as a reference in another passage. We we literally carry these dead bodies with us everywhere instead of living the life that God has given us. He never said it would be easy, but it's what he calls us to do. And because of this, all of these, this put together, Paul then goes into a little description. Okay, this is what happened. This is why. This is why you do it. Now, here's what you are to do. Here's the what, if you will. We are part of his ministry, God's ministry of reconciliation. Verse 18, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Do you understand? We are now the message of reconciliation to this world, to this lost and dying world. We carry this message of God to them. Hey, God wanted to make things right once again. Adam broke this relationship with God, and now it had to be restored. So God went, and he restored this relationship for us. He took the step forward. He took it upon himself to restore that relationship with mankind. And this restored relationship is available to anyone who will commit to receive and believe and offer their lives to Jesus. This is what we need to share with people. How do we do it? Well, we do it as a specific title. Paul gives us a title in this passage. You and I are all ambassadors. Did you know that? Did you know you are an ambassador for Christ if you are a follower of his? That is your role, clearly defined. Now, what's an ambassador? Well, great question, okay? You may or may not be aware of what a specific ambassador is. In our country today, our president appoints ambassadors to countries all over the entire world. And that person's job is supposed to be, I won't say they always do a good job, but their job is supposed to be 
to promote the ideals and interests of America, even sometimes to protect American citizens at times. But in the ancient world, things were very different. They had a similar job, but the description of how they performed it was a lot different. And so I found this description of it. The role of an ambassador was different than today. More critical, in fact, more important than the roles today because of communication methods. Today, if our ambassador to fill-in-the-blank country is having an issue or a problem or something like that, they can easily contact home and get information. They can answer questions. They can do all of those kinds of things. But in those times, in ancient Rome and beyond, the role of ambassador was very different because they were now responsible for making the decisions on their own. They didn't have anybody to go and ask. And so as the king or the president or whatever ruling authority you might view, you had to pick these people very, very carefully. The selection was done with great care. The candidate had to know the mind and heart of his ruler. They had to know the plans and the purposes of the king. They had to be skillful in presenting himself as though they were the monarch himself. But the ultimate purpose of an ambassador in any time being to develop a good relationship between the government they represented and the people of the host country and its rulers. Do you realize that you are ambassadors for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, in this country, in this place where people do not know him? You are here to represent him, to try to share his ideals and his values with those people around you, to share his love with all of these people that, we have in, that we're in contact with daily. I found this list of characteristics that ambassadors must possess to be effective, and I found it incredibly useful for us as believers in Christ and who we need to be reaching out to those that don't know Jesus yet. The first characteristic is that of patience. An ambassador listens carefully to both those in his host country, aka our God, and those in the country he's trying to persuade, trying to understand their needs and their situations, we have to listen to those we're trying to reach out to. Wisdom. An ambassador uses his knowledge of people to help solve conflict, if possible, to bring about a positive conclusion for all parties. He looks for common grounds on which to dialogue. When we converse with people, we look for bridges, ways that we have things in common, life experiences that we share, that we can then start to cross those bridges with Paul gave us those words, be wise in the way we act toward outsiders. Look for opportunities to reach out. Our graciousness in speech. This is an issue for a lot of followers of Christ. They're not very gracious in the way they present Jesus. An ambassador is a spokesperson for his country. We as ambassadors are a spokesperson for the God of the universe. And as such, we must be careful not to offend, but to entreat and encourage Let our words be gracious and seasoned with salt, as Paul shared with us last week. Now, here's the thing about being a follower of Christ. Might our words offend some? Absolutely, it's guaranteed they will if they're spoken correctly. Because this, the gospel and the cross are offensive. They are foolishness to those without it. We must understand that. But the way in which we use our words don't have to to be ingracious. They don't have to be rude or unkind. As a matter of fact, they should not be. Being generous, an ambassador is generous. It is concerned for the interests of others. Those in the host country, he's concerned about the interests of those people we are trying to reach on God's behalf. We will use our time, our talent to help others, especially as it promotes the the interests of the king, even if it requires personal sacrifice. Being generous to those apart from Christ will blow their mind. Being honest, an ambassador tells the truth and uses facts to persuade others. He neither deceives nor exaggerates to achieve his way. Your story is your fact. It's the only thing no one can ever argue with you about. Did you realize that? They can argue about you about Jesus, the Bible, you name it, from now until forever. And you can never, ever convince them, but they can never, ever argue with you about your life story. You're the only one that knows it. You're the only one that knows the difference Jesus has made in your life. They cannot argue with that. That's why it's so useful. Readiness of mind. An ambassador is alert for every opportunity to represent and promote the interests of his government and will not retreat from challenges 
or difficulty. Paul never passed on an opportunity to preach, preach Christ in his kingdom. If you follow the story through Acts, you see him before King Agrippa getting ready to be taken to Rome where he ultimately ends up being in prison forever and then executed. And what's the last thing he's doing standing before those people? Telling them about Jesus. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? That's just who he was. He never missed an opportunity to represent his government, that of Christ. Humility, an ambassador recognizes that he has no personal authority apart from the country that he represents. Further, as he provides instruction and direction, he explains the laws from his home country and how his God, in our case, does things. Paul might be the greatest example of an ambassador of all time, but do you realize how Paul considered himself? Here's a couple of phrases. He considered himself to be the least of all the apostles. Paul, the greatest ambassador of all times, claims, I am the greatest of sinners. That's the way Paul viewed his life. You see, he understood that everything he had, he received from Christ. He didn't earn it. He didn't deserve it. It's a gift. And as a result, it was a pleasure, no matter what befell him, to represent Christ in this world. And then I added one more to the list because I thought this was a great thing that you've seen ambassadors across the globe do. If you're in a a foreign country and there's something happening in that country and you need to try to escape quickly, where do you go? The embassy. Who's at the embassy? The ambassador. You see, the ambassador's role also is to protect the citizens of his host, of his native country. Okay, think of it this way. As a body of believers, one of your roles as an ambassador for Christ is to protect those within the body of believers. What does that look like? Well, it looks like this. Those that are MIA, those that are missing in action, those that you haven't seen in a while, those that have been missing for a few weeks, you have to reach out to them as an ambassador for Christ and just check on them. Check on their well-being, check on their physical health, their family. Just see how they're doing As people fall away, as people are led astray, you're an ambassador for Christ. You need to go to those members of your country and reach out to them and bring them back. Now, a lot of people put all of that weight on me or on just the elders or just the other leaders in the church, and that is not the case. We are all ambassadors for Christ. You're the first line of defense. I'm the first line of defense going out, reaching out to these people. And then when we find out what's going on, then we come back and as leadership form strategies to try to reach out to those people to help them through their times of need and crisis. This is a critical role of the body of Christ. And I wonder sometimes, do we really understand what this means? Do we understand our role in this? Because the reality is this, none of us are perfect. I'm not even close. We will never be able to represent Jesus perfectly, okay? But there's a really good thing about that because he's the one that gave us our assignment and he knows that we cannot do it on our own. He promises to be with us. And Jesus is perfect. The Holy Spirit, the one acting within us, is perfect. The one moving through you is perfect. The one guiding and directing you is perfect. The one opening your eyes to all the needs that exist all around you is absolutely perfect. And you and I have chosen his son. Because of this, God has now appointed us to be these ambassadors, to be these people with this ministry of reconciliation. It's an incredible thing. And what he does is he finds our faults, he knows our faults, and he fills in all of those gaps. He knows all of our shortcomings, and he fills those in. He alone is who sustains us in our assignment here on planet earth. And so I just have to ask, do you believe that? Do you believe that Christ has equipped you to do that or not? Do you believe truly that God can use you to make a difference because I've been in the church a long time and had a lot of conversations with people that go something like this. Yeah, that's great for them. I think they might do a great job, but I don't think God could ever use me for fill in the blank. A lot of conversations with people in the church saying things like that. Do you really believe God can use you to make a difference? Because I do. But more importantly, he created you in order to make a difference for him. Do you believe that God can restore this church and other churches and those within it to a place where he creates a love within us for him first and foremost, but then such a great love for all of us within this church for each other that the world will see this and they will find it completely irresistible? Do you believe that he can do that like I do? Because if you do, then we're on the same page and I can't wait to move forward in this next year with all of you. But here's the problem. You and I have to be willing to let him act. See, Jesus will not force us to be nice. He just won't. 
He won't force us to love one another. He won't force us to be his ambassadors. That's not how Jesus works. He gives us freedom, the freedom in him to do these things or to not do these things. It's up to us. But when we choose to love people one step closer to Jesus as his ambassador, then people will come. And when people come to get to know him and get to know you, we're going to have to teach them because they don't know. They, they don't know what normal is in the Christian world. I don't know if I know what normal is or what it should be even within the church. So we've got to be rich in mercy. We've got to be rich in grace. We've got to be intentional in our teachings. We can't skirt around the issues. We've got to address them head on and let people know exactly where God stands on these things, period. We can't ignore them, their reality. We've got to be willing to explain and even defend our Jesus because these people are being introduced to something that's so unlike anything the world has to offer that they'll have no idea how to take it in or handle it or absorb it or learn it or live it. And so we've got to show them the why. Why do we do this? This is actually the second week of our question series based on a question someone answered. Why do we commit to this type of life? Why do we commit to this kind of love? <laughs> why do we commit to following Jesus at all? Well, quite simply, John put it this way, 1 John four nineteen. We love because he first loved us. That's our motivation. We don't love because we have to. We don't love because it's a good idea. We don't love because we'll earn something. We don't love to earn God's favor, no. We love as a response to the love that he has shown us. It's our highest calling as believers. In fact, it's the only thing which Jesus really calls us to do. Every other thing God asks us to do fit within this short description of love. Yes, the pastor's making things really simple, but I ask you, is it really simple to love the way Christ loves? Is that an easy thing for us to do? Jesus is the one that gave us these instructions. I didn't make them up. He was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, well, okay, I can give you that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Key word, love your Lord your God with all, not some. The second one, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Christ's love compels us. Our love for him compels us to love and to serve others. Those in the world will not understand this love. They do not understand the sacrificial love of Jesus. It is not normal in our world. Likely, they will not understand our love for each other or our love for them when we begin to extend it outside of these walls. But here's what we do know. They will respond because love will draw them in. His love, first and foremost, will draw them in, and his love through us will draw them in to not just this place, but into the body of believers across this globe. And it's an incredible, incredible thing. Don't miss this opportunity moving forward to be nice as a church. Father God, as we close this series out, being nice isn't easy. Some people are just plain mean and rude, and they offend us, and they upset us. And Father, some of those are us. We're the ones who sometimes are rude and mean and cruel and vile, and we're supposed to be your ambassadors, Father. So if there are people here today that, that have fallen into that trap over the course of their life or maybe even recent history, we pray that you'll move them through your spirit to come and repent of that sin. Fathers, we're called to be nice to one another. If we've fallen short, I pray that we go to those people that we've harmed and we speak to them and we ask for your forgiveness as you've forgiven us. If people have harmed us, I pray that we forgive them in that same way that you forgive us. It's a requirement of us to do those things. As we consider our role as ambassadors for you, Father, we are representing you every moment of the day to our kids, to our spouses, to our coworkers, to the strangers we meet on the street. We are your ambassadors who they do not know you. We're in a foreign land and it's getting more and more foreign day after day. Father, let our words be clear. Let our love be intentional toward them as we reach out with your truth. And Father, if there's anybody here today that's never accepted that truth of who you are, has never come forward and confessed the name of Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, has never joined in the waters of baptism and been given that new life and shed that old one, I pray today is the day that you move them forward to make that decision for you, Father, so they can join with us here at Berea and across this globe as we strive to represent you in our ministry of reconciliation as we seek to love this world in the same way you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.